What a year 2021 brought to us indeed, one dominated yet again by the COVID-19 pandemic. 2021 started out with the hope of new vaccines. The rollout was slow at first, leading to more lockdowns in the spring. By June, 20% of Canadians were fully vaccinated. By July, nearly 80% of Canadians had received a first vaccine dose. So in August, the Trudeau government decided to head to the polls, hoping to get a majority. But they got the same result as 2019. And we end the year in much the same way that we started it, with talks of lockdowns, restrictions, and a another pandemic wave, something certainly Canadians don't want to talk about, but here we find ourselves and we're going to be talking about it with our political correspondents here in Ottawa. Joining me is our chief political correspondent, David Aiken. He's on remote because we are being very careful in these uh, new variant times. And here in the studio with me are parliamentary correspondents, Michael Couture and Abigail Beeman, both six feet away from me, six feet away from each other. Uh, we're being very careful here. You know, I think last year we all thought that we would get to this year and hopefully not still be talking about COVID-19 as the big story. There's been a lot of stories though this year. The election, which also had COVID undertones, uh, military sexual misconduct, how the Conservatives performed, all of these things coming out. We want to find out your real opinions on covering these stories because we see the side in front of the news, but we don't always get to hear those behind the scenes stories and how we process things as reporters. David, let's start with you. What was the standout story for you of 2021? It has to be the federal election and the results aside, it's the very fact that we had an election, an election, especially when we look around the world and to our neighbors in the South, that none of the participants challenged the validity of the election, Not, no candidate, no party, uh, no voter. We carried off an election in which, by and large, uh, there is no questions about the legitimacy. There's some issues about people in, in some northern uh, First Nations communities didn't have polling places. That needs to be tended to, but I think it's a highlight that we got through a federal pandemic election safely, by and large, with no questions about the legitimacy. And I think that's a testament largely to the Elections Canada folks, who I know who were under a lot of pressure and, and had to work hard to pull off 338 separate races involving thousands of candidates in very trying conditions. So I'd say uh, that's a highlight and it follows other elections too. In Nova Scotia, they had a provincial election, same thing, safe and, and worked. Newfoundland and Labrador, they had some hiccups. They had some lockdowns, couldn't do in-person and voting back there in February. But we can do elections here in Canada safely in a pandemic where people are not questioning the legitimacy of the results. Yeah, and uh, certainly something that was a big question mark, how that election would unfold given all of the restrictions and given what we saw our southern neighbours just go through. Abigail, what was the standout story for you this year? For me, I, I think it was the pandemic and, you know, you, you say it exactly right that there were a lot of people hoping that we wouldn't still be talking about this as a headline at, at this point. But uh, the, the issues of, of how do you have a hybrid parliament and how much are parties going to work together and how much will politics play into that? We're still dealing with the pandemic. We're still having these, you know, weekly or, or sometimes more updates from public health. This is still top of mind. It's still affecting uh, so many people's lives that for me, it stood out and also the sense of of things feeling the same. I mean, uh, it, David touched on the the idea of the election turning out the same result, but we're, we're in essentially the same place in terms of the, the breakdown in the House from parties, and it feels very much like we're in the same place uh, in terms of, of COVID and, and having these same conversations about restrictions and, and, and the state of things. So this idea of sameness, I think, stands out for me across 2021, both on the politics and on the public health front. Yeah, it really does feel um, a little bit like the song that never ends or Groundhog Day, whatever your cultural comparison is um, that a lot of us are still processing March of 2020. I think I feel like I'm still in April of 2020, but at the end of 2021, Mike, what stood out for you? Yeah, I think, you know, to everybody's point, yeah, COVID-19, the election, I'm going to go off the board for a second here. And I think the highlight for me was unanimous consent on conversion therapy. That was something that I think nobody expected in this parliament. We came back to parliament with the same result as 2019. And a lot of people looked at it and went, well, now we're going to have the same political games. And then somehow the day that it came on the 
floor of the House of Commons. The Conservatives surprise everybody and call for a, um, a, a vote on unanimous consent to, to pass conversion therapy. Why I think this is important, not only because I covered this story, but the ramifications of this. One, that the Conservatives were trying to put this issue behind them so that it wouldn't continue to hang over them. Two, speaking to survivors of it and doing this story. So touching to hear from these people who said that this is so important to them to finally get through this, to finally have this being illegal on the books. And not only that, it happened in the House of Commons, unanimous consent, also in the Senate, how quickly this was passed maybe gives me a little bit of hope going into the new year that potentially this parliament can work towards a better end for Canadians. And, you know, talking to that survivor, exchanging emails with him after it was passed, how shocked he was, but so happy he was that this is finally passed through the House. And certainly a, a big relief to a lot of people and a rare showing of not just bipartisan, but exactly. all party support for this, exactly. uh, for something that people really felt needed to happen and was the right thing. It's always nice in politics when they're not squabbling and they come together on important issues. Uh, David, do you think we're going to see that trend continue, or is it going to devolve into more partisan bickering as we head into 2022? There was a different kind of partisan bickering, and, and it's, it's from those who are very angry at the current public health environment. And again, this goes back to the election. All of us were out on the road with various leaders. We traveled around the country. And, uh, you know, uh, Abigail, I think, was there when people were throwing rocks at the prime minister, some of which hit members of the media. Um, we were all there to watch angry mobs using the most foul-mouthed obscenities, often with kids in their arms, yelling at political candidates. Didn't matter the candidate. It was New Democrats, it was Liberals. Uh, I know Conservative Premiers were experiencing this same sort of threats of violence. I've talked to MPs of all parties who say they've never seen an electorate so angry, anger turning into threats, threats sometimes turning into violence. We're going to have an election in Ontario next year in 2022. And I know that Doug Ford's Conservatives, they're the incumbent. Uh, and they've been, you know, right there in lockstep with every other province imposing lockdowns and public health measures to keep us safe. And they are expecting to see the same kind of angry mobs at their rallies that Justin Trudeau's liberals saw at theirs. So that was a low light for 2021. And that's something to keep an eye on for 2022. Abigail, you were there. You experienced it. Do you think that this is going to continue into the next year? You know, I, I don't want to make any predictions there because it was just so uh, incomprehensible to watch. In ter just in terms, not, not incomprehensible incompreh that people are frustrated, not incomprehensible that people are fed up with what's going on. But, you know, David touched on it. To see this level of anger is something I've never witnessed before. To, to feel that tension in those crowds. We all we all knew that at some point this was going to escalate. You talk about the, the rock or the gravel or however you want to describe what was thrown through the, the crowds that, that evening. But we all could say Sense that, that that there was going to be an escalation there just because of the level of vitriol and and the the constant profanity and and like you say ch you know people holding babies and just screaming their heads off with with such a level of anger so I you know I hope that that we don't see that again going forward but I certainly uh, you know was was caught off guard by the the level of intensity and and how long it lasted for that I, I wouldn't want to make a prediction going forward Mike final to you. yeah I'm a little concerned that this is a line that we've crossed now and that people think that this is going to be permissible going forward and that uh, looking at how it all played out I mean Abigail you were there everybody who you know was on that liberal campaign felt that vitriol from people and and you know, understanding that people now feel like they have the ability to do this and they're allowed to do this. And I hope that we can all take away from this campaign that we look at and go, no, that was the line that we will never cross again. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of faith in that because I think that people think, you know, I did it once, I can do this again because I have a voice, I'm allowed to do this and I'm allowed to do this, as you said, in front of kids. And I'm, I'm really worried that going ahead in f future elections that people are gonna say, hey, I'm gonna do this again. Yeah, I, I think that we're all concerned and we all hope for a better 2022 in many ways. Let's hope that when we're back here a year from now, it's not another COVID-19 discussion. Maybe our politics are a little bit more positive. Thank you to the three of you for joining us and for all your hard work this year.